My short nasiha, my short talk is going to be about standing firm on our principles and that we're going to be tested, brothers and sisters. Now, before I get to discuss that we are going to be tested in our lives and it is a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this life is a life of ibtila, it's a life of test. I want us to understand our context because if we really think about it, we should be so grateful for everything that we have. Alhamdulillah, honestly, we are in the top two and a half percent of the world. Just being in the West, we're in the top two and a half percent of the world. The minute we have two or three meals a day is the minute that we should be thinking we are kings. In actual fact, the definition of a king at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was that they had access to running water and honey on the table. Not only do we have access to water and honey, but we have everything else that we have access to. So from that point of view, brothers and sisters, we should be so grateful living in the 21st century, living in this particular time, in this particular place of the world. Because we have food, shelter, clothing, and everything else. So from that point of view, we have a lot to be grateful for. In this context, we also have to understand that we're going to be tested. We're going to be tested, brothers and sisters, with hardship, and we're going to be tested with the good times. Because sometimes when we think about tests, we think, oh, I have to be in pain, I have to lose something. That's not necessarily true. The concept of a test in Islam is that we're going to be tested with the good life and with the bad life. We're going to be tested with the pain and with the pleasure. And there are so many ayat in the Quran, so many hadiths from the Prophet wasallam that clearly indicate that we're going to be tested. Very famous ayat in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 214, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically says to us that do you think you're going to go to Jannah? without being tested and Allah refers to the people before the messengers and the companions that were tested so much that they said where is the help of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says indeed the help of Allah is qareeb is close so from this point of view we're going to be tested and the interesting spiritual wisdom behind tests is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it as a means, as a spiritual mechanism for us to come closer to him and for us to go into paradise, Jannah. And this is why the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith in Tirmidhi, when he said that when Allah loves somebody, he's going to test them. When Allah loves somebody, he's going to test them. And from this point of view, test are a spiritual mechanism and a means in order to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, from this point of view, being in a state of test is also purifying and testing our character. It cultivates the Islamic virtues. It cultivates the Islamic virtues in order for us for to be purified and elevated spiritually so we can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why it's so significant to understand that there is a lot of blessing in trials and tests because it shows us who we are. And this is very significant. It's so easy to be a good Muslim when you have your food, your shelter, your clothing, your happiness, your work, your job, your money. If everything is fine, it's easy to be a good Muslim, right? It's easy. And that's why in marriage advice, I speak to some brothers when they ask me for the rare advice. And I say to them, don't judge somebody by what they do when everything is fine. But rather, look into their character on how they react when they are tested with trials. That's when you know the person is someone of taqwa or someone who needs some work. And it's very, very significant for us to internalize this concept and not to use it to judge others, but to see where we are 
on the spiritual spectrum. How close are we to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because the concept of trials and tests really shows to us, am I inclining towards Allah or running away from Him? When things become difficult and hard, when my dignity has been affected, when I lose a bit of money, I lose my job, something is taken away from me, when I have slander, backbiting going on, something's happening in the community, people are pointing fingers, where do I go? Do I hurry towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or do I give my morals up? And do I give up my struggle towards Allah? And do I now struggle towards my own hawa, my ego and my nafs? And that's very important because test and trials really bring up our true character. So in this context, brothers and sisters, I want to give you some principles that we have to stand firm on, have our ground, really dig our heels, so we could basically, inshallah, be successful as a community, not only in the United States, not only in the West, but generally as an ummah. So principle number one. Principle number one, brothers and sisters, is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where it begins, and this is where it ends. This is our raison d'etre. It's our reason for existence. Worshipping Allah. What does worship really mean? It means to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to single out all acts of worship to Allah alone. This is what we mean by worship in and of itself. And for us to be true worshippers, we have to understand worship is not like a business transaction. Like you have one business partner, he's equal to another business partner, and they make a transaction. This is not worship. But unfortunately amongst our community, you know, I hear some brothers come up to me and say, bro, Hamza, I prayed for a whole month. I did tahajjud for a whole month. And you know what? I still failed my exams. So I'm not praying anymore. I'm like, hold on a second. Who do you think you are? <laughs> right? You're not on the same level playing field here. You're not on the same level playing field. You are the slave. Allah is the master. Allah deserves worship even if he gave you the crumbs of the world. And we really have to significantly understand this. Because we worship Allah because of who Allah is. Allah is Al-Ilah. He is the one deserved of worship regardless if we receive anything from his bounty. But we do receive lots of things from its bounty. But that's not the point. The point is we worship Allah because of who He is. How many times do we watch the television, we watch great people of great sporting achievement, or singers, or artists, and we praise them. We give them a standing ovation. We say bravo. We give them some kind of honor from the point of view of saying that they're such a great sports person. They've got such a great voice. They have attributes that we praise. Although they don't benefit us directly, yet we praise people because of some praiseworthy attributes. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, laysa kemithli hi shaykh, there is nothing like unto him, and his names and attributes we affirm, and we also understand they are totally transcendent, and they are boundless. So when we say Allah is al-wudud, he is the loving, coming from the word wud, which means the loving that is giving, we mean here it's the purest form of love, it's the maximal type of love. Allah is maximally perfect. His names and attributes have no deficiency or flaw. So from this point of view, something should be happy, happening inside us. We would want to praise Allah because He has praiseworthy realities, His names and attributes. Because if we could do it for a singer or a pop star, or some guy who knows how to play a flute, or some guy who can run 200 meters very fast, then surely we should be wanting to show our perfect gratitude and praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very important, brothers and sisters, that we worship Allah. Worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is where our success lies. Allah says in Surah Mu'minun, indeed, successful are the believers. That's the first principle, worshiping Allah. And everything now in our lives is a derivative of our purpose, which is to worship Allah. And if we don't understand it from this point of view, it's like committing spiritual suicide. Because our main objective is to worship Allah, 
And if we don't see our whole life through those lenses, then it's no different from committing spiritual suicide. Second principle, love for others what you love for yourself. Love for others what you love for yourself. The Prophet وسلم, said in a hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يهب لأخيه ما يهب لنفسه. You won't truly believe unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. أخيه, your brother. Imam Rajab al Hanbali in his compendium of wisdom and knowledge, he said this doesn't just mean Muslim. This means insaniya and nas humanity. You love for others what you love for yourself. There's another hadith in Al Bukhari narrated by Al Bukhari in Tarikh Al Kabir. It's an authentic hadith, and it says. To love for linnas, for people, humanity, what you love for yourself. So a defining feature of who we are and who we want to be is to love for others what we love for yourselves. As the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن, You won't truly believe unless you love for others what you love for yourself. And if we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we love the Messenger وسلم, we should be giving this love to other people, right? According to this spiritual principle of these hadith, if we love Allah and the Messenger, and for us to be true believers, we have to give what we love to others, then if we love Allah and His Messenger, we should be giving that love to other people. Right? Are you with me? So how do you give that love to other people? How do you give the love of Allah and the love of the Messenger وسلم, to other people? What do you have to do? Give dawah. Did you hear what the brother said? Pay attention. Give dawah. Exactly. And this is why we need to be responding to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to that which gives us life. This is very significant. It's a key part of defining who we are. It's a key part of loving for others what we love for ourselves is giving dawah. Showing why I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Showing why I love the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And especially in our times of a post-Trump era, we must be showing people what Islam is about now. We can't be blaming the Zionists and Fox News anymore. Islamophobia. I really believe a lot of Islamophobia is actually dawahphobia, right? It's dawahphobia. We're too scared to talk about who we are. Don't get me wrong, there are haters. They're going to exist. But the point is, don't be a victim. Don't be a victimhood person that suffers from the pathology and disease of being a victim. This is not of the sunnah. If you study the seerah, you will see that every calamity and trial the Prophet ﷺ would use in order to create a new realm of possibility in order for him to call people to la ilaha illallah. And this is very, very significant for us to understand, brothers and sisters. So love for others for what you love for yourself. Third principle. Tolerance and forbearance. Tolerance and forbearance. To forgive and to overlook, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? So you should forgive others too. This is a key principle in the Quran. It's a key principle in our tradition. When we study the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was so forgiving and he had tolerance concerning negativity and hardship. We know the famous story of the man who pulled him by the neck and left a mark. And one of the Sahaba wanted to actually, you know, sort him out. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with, with, with hilm, with hilm, with forbearance and humility and compassion, gave them both advice. We needed something better from both of you. That you tell him to ask for his debt properly and you advise me to pay for my debt. This sense of forbearance was a key feature of the character of the Prophet ﷺ. To forgive and overlook so we don't become petty people anymore. We look at the prize. We don't look at the small things. So what? They said something about you. Forgive them. Forgive them. It will free you from such a burden. With all these things that you're holding on your neck. The stuff that you're holding within you. Just forgive. Let it go. You want everybody to go to Jannah. You want everyone to be happy. You want to free yourself from the burden of why did they do this? Why did they do that? Pointing fingers. Keep your eye on the prize, brothers and sisters. Paradise. Just forgive people. Everyone's going to end in their grave. 
everyone's going to have to account for their deeds and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from this point of view, understand that everyone is weak, everyone is on a journey, forgive and overlook and have forbearance. The next principle, brothers and sisters, is following Allah and His Messenger. And this is very significant. It links to worshipping Allah, but I want to bring it out as a key principle here. Is to obey Allah and His Messenger. Now the first point I want to add is, as a principle, this is the most rational principle in the world. But we're brought up in the West, to obey is very negative. To obey is like, you know, you have blind faith. I really hate this attitude, honestly. Obedience to Allah is the summit of intellectual, spiritual activity. Obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the peak of what it means to be a rational, spiritual human being. This is, I'm being so honest here. Why am I saying this? Because if you look at general life, when you see the atheists or the agnostics or the other people, whoever they are, they obey something all the time. When you go to the doctor, you give them your symptoms. What does the doctor say? Take this medicine. What do you do? You take the medicine. You don't question. You don't say where are your qualifications. You don't say show me the science behind this. Because you admit that they are an authority. There is a certain authority or wisdom that you submit to. I came here on a plane. I'm on a plane quite often these days. What do I usually hear? Ladies and gentlemen, please sit down and fasten your seatbelt. There will be some moderate to high turbulence. What do I do? I sit down, I buckle up, dua, right? Well, I should be making dua anyway. I don't basically say, who does the pilot think he is? The silly man. He doesn't know nothing about the plane or turbulence. And I'm going to start moonwalking on the plane. <laughs> That's not going to happen, is it? Right? Because I obey his authority. Because I know he has a particular knowledge that I don't have, right? So... Whether we're on the plane, at school, university, medicine, teachers, whatever the case may be, we submit our own limited wisdom and authority to a greater, higher wisdom and authority. Just like the famous, well, she's not famous, but I've probably made her famous. I spoke about her quite a lot. Dr. Elizabeth Fricker, she's an epistemologist. It's a big word. Don't worry about that. Basically, she says, she says that given my limitations as parametric, that I have limitations, I have to submit myself to an authority. So the point here is this. Who is the greater authority? The pilot, the teacher, the doctor, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is the greater authority? Exactly. So is it more rational to submit to a teacher, a doctor, or a pilot, or to Allah? I can't hear you. Allah, exactly. So it's the most rational thing to do. So let's not fall for the so-called satanic intellectualism, right? The pseudo-intellect of shaitan. When Allah told him to bow down to Adam, what did shaitan say? Hold on a second. I made a fly. I made a flyer. He's made a clay. You need fire for clay, right? So he didn't obey because of his arrogance. He was the first pseudo-rationalist. He denied the ultimate authority. From this perspective, we have to understand Allah is al-Hakim. He has the totality of wisdom and knowledge. Allah has the picture. We just have one pixel. And that's a very key principle. And when we follow this principle, we don't adopt the methodology of our enemies. Let me repeat what I'm saying here. We do not adopt the methodology of our enemies. What do our enemies do? And I'm not giving any labels here, but our enemies, they otherize us. What does otherization mean? Otherization is actually the basis for genocide. If you look at a lot of social theorists, they say to otherize a group is the basis for hatred and genocide. Now, otherization, brothers and sisters, not to say here are Muslims, here are Christians, here are Jews. That's fine. It's natural to categorize groups within a society. But otherization is not only do you categorize another people as a group, but you categorize them negatively and you say they're a monolith. They're all the same. That is otherization. And unfortunately, we adopt the same methodology, right? We say, oh, Republicans, they're just all right-wing nuts. That's not true. That's just not true, right? In any shape, my publishers are Republicans, and they're really decent people. 
So what you need to understand is this, that we shouldn't adopt the methodology just because social media is saying something, Google is saying something, our groupies are saying something, yeah, it must be right. We have to adopt a Quranic ethical approach to understanding human peop different peoples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Imran, verse 113, Laysa sawaha, they're not the same, they're not all alike. People are not all alike. If you look at the Mufassireen, at Tabri, Ibn Kathir and others, they discuss that even amongst the Jews and the Christians, you have people that are different and they're just and upright. So from this point of view, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that yes, there are groups of people, but not everybody is the same. And this creates a more of a nuanced approach to understanding different peoples and it actually prevents extremism because violent extremism especially is when you have in your own mind and in your own heart that there is a group of people, they're all enemies, they're all negative, and they're all the same. This is not a Quranic approach. Finally, the seventh or eighth principle, I lost count, is to follow our principles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, you who have believed, why do you say that which you do not do? And this is very significant. You know, the Muslim community is very good at jumping on the civil rights bandwagon, right? Social justice, right? Everybody loves social justice. Everybody loves civil rights. Yes, right? Am I wrong? No. But what's very interesting is that we need to start now following that which we preach, becoming that which we say, doing that which we claim to be, and being that which we know. We have to be that which we know and what which we preach. If there's a disconnect, there's no barakah. And I'm giving this a sincere advice. We have an amazing movement called Black Lives Matter, okay? This is an amazing movement. Agreed? Put your hand up who agrees with Black Lives Matter. Excellent. Now let me just give you some advice though. Do Black Lives Matter in our community, especially amongst some of the Desi community, and from a subconscious psychodynamic point of view. And it's very significant, we dig deep and we uproot some of these things so we have baraka in our political social discourse. Because brothers and sisters, there could be many black brothers in this room who converted to Islam. And some of the best brothers I know in Islam are black brothers. Very principled. And they became a Muslim in the Desi community 10 years ago, for example. And you hear, Allahu Akbar, new Muslim, uncles crying, right? Uncles crying, here's some money, bata, right? And then teach them how to pray, take care of them. And they see the man growing in Islam over 10 years. And when he's mature spiritually, when he's mature socially, he goes to the same uncle, Daisy uncle, this black brother, and says, Uncle G, he even speaks a bit of Urdu for him, throws in the Iqbal poetry, whatever the case may be, and says, Uncle G, I know your daughter's not married, I'm humbly asking for your daughter's hand. What is he gonna say, generally speaking? His pacemaker's gonna jump out of his chest. He'll have a heart attack. We'll have to do CPR. He'll be like, what are you talking about, <laughs> right? And then, <laughs> but this is significant. If we don't talk about this in our communities, we're going to be finished. It's going to be a shallow community. And this is true. And I see this all the time. I travel the whole world. I get the same complaints. And what happens is very interesting is that we take this as something very light. But you know there's a hadith in Tirmidhi, which is an authentic hadith, and there are two versions. One is not authentic, the other one's authentic. And listen to this very carefully and it will shock you. The Prophet ﷺ said, if a man comes to your daughter with good morals and you reject him for no good reason, there will be tribulation and corruption in the world. I repeat, if a man comes to your daughter with good morals and you reject him for no Islamic reason, right? There will be corruption and tribulation in the world. And the Sahaba asked him why he has some kind of deficiency. Do you know how he replied? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
if a man comes to your daughter with good morals and you reject him for no reason, there'll be tribulation and corruption in the world. Maybe brothers and sisters, uncle, auntie, for rejecting that nice black brother or white brother or green brother or blue brother, whoever they are, maybe that's part of the reason why we have calamity and tribulation in the world. And this gets us to realize that our moral actions, our spiritual state of being is affecting the whole ummah. It's affecting the whole world. And we really have to internalize this point. Allah says in the Quran that there'll be facade on the earth and the sea because what their hands have earned. We may be the weakest link. You know, we could be protest protesting for the Rohingya and for the Syrian brothers and sisters and people all around the world. But if we don't adopt and internalize our own principles, there'll be no barakah. And maybe it's by not internalizing those principles that we're creating the facade and the tribulation and calamity around the world. It's time to wake up to this reality. So brothers and sisters, we memorize a lot. Some of us know more Quran than Sahaba. Some of you know more Hadith than some Sahaba. But what made them different is that they internalized what they knew and that's part of really following that key principle so just to end brothers and sisters to give you some hope now not to depress you all the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in an authentic hadith it's in abu Dawood and tirmidhi he said ahead of you there lie days of patience during which being patient would be like the grasping of a hot coal the one who does good deeds then will have a reward like that of 50 men who do, who do such good deeds. And someone else added, they said, O Messenger of Allah, the reward of 50 of them? He said, the reward of 50 of you. So maybe, depending what Trump does, we may be living in those times, and any good deeds you do, it'd be like 50 of the reward of the Sahaba. So that gives you hope, that gives you glad tidings as well. But don't be under any superficial self-delusion. There's work to do. And just finally, just to end on this, I do apologize. I've slightly run over time. Be Muslims of real life. Allah says in the Quran, O oh, you who have believed, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger to that which gives you life. Yuhyikum, that which gives you a sense of life. Some of the ulama say, if you don't respond to this call, you're a dead Muslim walking. And I want you to reflect upon your lives. Many of us, our lives are no different from a life of an animal. Just like what Al-Ghazali said in his Alchemy of Happiness, in the first few pages of that book. Because we just respond to our instincts. You may get a PhD, brothers and sisters, but that's still an instinct. Survival, I want a good job. You may get a pretty wife, but what is that? Procreation, an instinct, no different from a camel or a goat or a bacterium. You took her to Mexico for a honeymoon, same thing, based on your instinct, procreation. You bought a big house, survival. Bought a big car, survival, right? Get loads of kids, survival, procreation. Most of the things that we do as a human species is reduced to the core biological instincts. We're no different from a bacterium on the posterior of a dead, rotting rat. What makes you different though? What gives you real life? Allah is giving you the solution. Respond to his call. Imam Bukhari said he's responding to all that is good. Be good people. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.